Hi guys and welcome to another Shonen Ronin video presented by me, Posadist Pac-Man. If you want to help the channel, please click like and subscribe for future updates and videos, and also come subscribe to me as well because, as I always say, I'm vain and I desperately need the self-validation. But today we're going to be talking about one of the industry heavy hitters, one of the big stories. Of course we're going to be talking about Tokyo Ghoul. Let's get to it. Only collective efforts can address the major issues of our times, and that requires regulating identity to a secondary status in service of the public good, and causes that affect more rather than less people. Christopher Mott Heroes don't exist in a vacuum. They emerge from the collective in order to deal with threats. In order to have a hero, by definition, villains must exist, even if the villain is the world itself. But the world is in of itself neutral. It is a human who designs the labels of heroes and villains. Thus, in order to understand how heroes are created, we must first understand how we create villains. As for anime and manga, one of the most explicit examples of the creation of villains is of course Tokyo Ghoul. And the ghouls, in fact, mirror the creation of the real life group that have been labeled as villains, the Yakuza. Admittedly, the ghouls of Tokyo Ghoul are not in a strict sense genetically identical to the majority as is the case with the Yakuza, but seeing as how they were artificially created, I think they work well as an analogy for the manufacturing of an underclass who become villains well enough. To start with on this topic, I'm going to talk about some offensive words and their origins. Borakumi translates to village people, and is of course a euphemism to denounce the quote, impure people, and non-human. They were not an official underclass until the Edo period, although discrimination against this group of people existed well before. What motivated their official designation was the elite's desire to adopt Chinese practices with their own unique spin. Confucianism, for example, is a belief system which the elites of Japan adopted from China. It divides people into scholars and farmers, artisans and merchants, and it was created so that peace can be maintained via everyone knowing their role. Know your place. Japan has been looking to China for what to do for all their history as a nation state, but they also had their own religion in Shinto. In Shinto, there is a concept known as the Kiragi. It is similar to the Judeo-Christian concept of sin, that being spiritual uncleanliness, though unlike in Christianity, you're not born with it. Rather, it can come about by the things you do and the things that happen to you. The Ita and the Hinin were forced to do jobs that were considered necessary but unclean in a spiritual sense, i.e. cutting meat, handling the dead, prostitution, begging, and <laughs> entertainment, actors. The Hinin and Ita were legally, religiously, and socially excluded from Japanese society. They were Japan's untouchables. Borakamin were not even counted on the census. They were forced to wear their own clothes, live in ghettos, and were tattooed. They weren't allowed to own farms, change their status, or even marry outside their group. If you're familiar with the idea of race as a social construct, you'll rarely find a better example. Like with all oppressed minority groups, many turn to crime to make ends meet, like they do today. And up until the modern day, they controlled gambling in the country almost entirely, and they formed gangs to protect themselves, something the government wouldn't do. Not unlike how gangs in other countries form, such as the Crips, to give an American example. And things like tattoos that society viewed as a form of shame, they took as a badge of honour. In 1871, the Burakamin were given full legal rights by the Meiji government, which worked about as well as the Reconstruction did in American history. Yeah. Society continued to oppress them. Their neighbours were kept as poor as possible. Records were kept so that families would continue to avoid marrying untouchables, and they were illegally blacklisted from employment. Obviously, this summary is far from sufficient, so if you want a more in-depth explanation, definitely check out Redabrek's video on the topic and tell him we sent you. The reason why I bring all of this up is simple. It provides a good lesson on Maslow's hierarchy and why you shouldn't dismiss the lumpen proletariat that are also reflected in Tokyo Ghoul. I would say that the main themes of Tokyo Ghoul are the consequences of ostracization and the desire for self-actualization that all of us have. And from the orphaning of young girls to the formation of clown gangs, these themes are shown to be clearly intertwined. Ostracization becomes both a hindrance and a tool for self-actualization as the most oppressed and excluded show the most potential. The story of the Black Goat's Egg, which is discussed in chapter 1 and brought up repeatedly, reflects Kanki's journey throughout the manga, as he is turned into a ghoul just as the son of a murderer in the story. He has come to terms with his violent instincts as he follows in his mother's footprints. Though he fights it in the beginning, he eventually has to accept that he needs to give in to his urges for human meat and fight to live and protect those he loves. The story of an innocent boy giving into his violent impulses before being able to pursue a higher level needs like heroism were predicted in Maslow's Pyramid. 
Kanki, at the beginning of the manga, attempted to address his top of the pyramid needs first. He wanted to fulfill his esteem needs not by committing cannibalism as he saw it. He wanted to self-actualize as a human being, but of course this doesn't work because the ideas we have in our head are reflective of material reality. To do the opposite of this is called being delusional and is considered unhealthy, obviously. Therefore, if one's physiological needs of food and shelter are different from another species, one cannot expect or be expected to identify and live up to the norms of that species. Maslow proposed a series of motivational stages, each building on the previous one, i.e. one cannot progress without satisfying the previous stage. Progression through the stages is based on life circumstances and achievements, i.e. it is flexible. Individuals move up the motivational stages on the pyramid in order to reach self-actualization. The first four stages function as stepping stones. In other words, it is much more materialist in an analysis of identity formation, as opposed to Ericsson's model, for example. But the sharp ones among you will have already noticed something interesting. The ghouls, as were revealed late into the story, are artificial in their origins. So these beings, who have no choice but to be forced into an antagonistic relationship with humanity, relationships on which they form a variety of villainous and anti-heroic identities, can blame these dangerous self-actualizations on the fact that they are an oppressed minority, which wouldn't even exist if it hadn't been for the inhumanity of the elites in the first place. Taken to its logical extremes, Maslow's hierarchy has a hidden class character. Just like the Yakuza or the Crips, or any number of groups throughout history, the ghouls begin to take pride in being different from society, even if that difference causes disruption and danger because they literally have no other choice. In Persona 5, there is a character that used to be part of the Yakuza, represented by the Hangman Tarot card. The author of Tokyo Ghoul is famous for including tarot card imagery in certain panels, and in one such instance in which Kanki flips from timid to violent after the torch and hangman symbolism is used, one of the meanings that can be derived from that, one of the meanings that can be indeed derived from any hangman, is that you must let go of whatever it is that is holding you back. Since the hanged man reflects feelings of being stuck or suspended in life, for both Kanki and this character in Persona 5 to both be represented by the hangman symbol says a lot. And as we can see, the author Sui Ishida doesn't just add in these symbols or stories without thought. Rather, he chooses to incorporate that which adds to the story, either by acting as an interesting comparison to the plot or using it to foreshadow future events in the plot. One story he brings up which adds to the point about the consequences of ostracization is The Metamorphoses by Kafka, in which a man is turned into a giant insect by unknown means. After being transformed, he notices that in his state, his taste in food has changed, no longer being able to eat fresh foods and instead preferring things like rotten cheese. This parallels Kaneki as he begins to dislike foods he once liked as well, as well as many other similarities. The story is also famously one about alienation, as are a lot of Kafka's work, and alienation is what defines collective villainy. From the League of Villains in My Hero Academia to the Phantom Troop out of Meteor City in Hunter x Hunter. Fiction has often been drawn from real life in how criminality and alienation go hand in hand. There is no tackling the supposed monsters society creates that is separate from being able to recognize them and helping them self-actualize in ways that are compatible with us all. And that in effect is the essence of collective heroism, because it is the essence of sacrificing one's own ego for another. After all, the Yakuza can help create Nintendo. <laughs> they did, in fact, and have often acted as real life Robin Hoods as well as enforcing the law when the police certainly wouldn't. For all the collective bad they've done, they've also done a lot of good and have hearts like everyone else. In short, even they are human. And that shines through both in good and bad ways, regardless of label. And I'm sure there are plenty of kankies out there acting as bridges to close the divide, one cup of coffee at a time. Thanks for watching, guys. This has been Posada's Pac-Man. This has been the writing of the Hunter x Hunter Dick Riding Association. And of course, on the lovely channel of Shonen Ronan, edited by our wonderful comrade Calliope. Again, like I said at the start, if you want to support the channel, please hit like and subscribe down below. Make sure you click the bell too, so you get notified of when we upload, because YouTube's algorithm is a fucking dick. And also come over and subscribe to me, because as I said before, I need the self-validation. I'm just over 1,200 subs now, or at least I should be, so I'd like to see you all over there if you aren't already. Anyway, nice to see you all. Stay watching anime. Stay loyal to the revolution. Viva Posadas. I'll see you next time.